That's the most important message that we needed to hear this morning is that God loves us. Sometimes we forget that, huh? It, it's, it's not about our performance, although I, we want to perform good, if I can use that term. But it's not about our performance. It, it's God's unconditional love for you. Uh, I wish I could comprehend how, how, how much God loves me. I'm still learning. I think I'm learning as a dad that because as a dad, I love my kids unconditionally. It doesn't matter what Josiah does or Jaden does. I get upset when they do bad things, but I still have that unconditional love for them. I try to correct them and teach them the right ways, but I'm never going to stop loving my children, no matter what. And so that's how God looks at you. He's never going to stop loving you, no matter what. He wants us to learn, obviously, from our mistakes. But he's, he's always going to love you. So if you have your Bibles, could you go to Acts chapter 2, verse 42? Um, I'm going to do a quick review for those of you that weren't here last week. Uh, and so this is the beginning church. And so our prayer is that we could be like this church. It's going to be hard to be like this church, but the same spirit that empowered the first church could also inspire, inspire and empower our church as well. Let's pray before I get into the Word. Father, guys, as I get ready to open up the, the Bible, uh, I know that, that it's, it's your spirit that makes the difference. It, it's, it's not uh, me, Lord. I, I don't, I'm not the best preacher in the world, but Holy Spirit, you are. So I just pray that you speak to us. To speak to our hearts this morning. Help us hear what you want us to hear. And help us to put uh, these things into practice. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. And so the first century church, uh, they were a learning church. It takes a lot of humility to, to go to church and say, I'm going to learn something today. So that, that was their attitude. They, they would meet in homes. Uh, the first church wasn't in a building. They, they didn't have a building yet. They, they eventually would meet outside the church too. It was interesting, uh, Jesus met, he had church in homes, he had a church service on a boat, he had a church service on a mountaintop. Jesus had church everywhere. Wherever he went, that was church. And so we're having church today. And so the, the, his disciples were always learning. And now the disciples are doing the teaching. They're the teachers now that Jesus left, and the Holy Spirit is empowering them to remember everything that they learned from Jesus. And they're, they're teaching the people uh, the powerful truths they learned from the Lord. So the first century church was a learning church. Two, they were a forgiving church. We know that they weren't a perfect church. They made mistakes. But they, they learned from their mistakes. Uh, there, there are times in the, in the Bible like Paul had an argument with a, a guy named Barnabas. They, did, they didn't get along. and They parted ways. They went their separate directions. But eventually, they got back together and they became friends again. So, sometimes we, we idolize the first century church, or the apostles. We, we think that they were like holy angels. They weren't holy angels. They were human beings, just like us. They made mistakes. Peter made mistakes. Matthew made mistakes. John made mistakes. They were, they were broken people who needed forgiveness. And so, they, they were willing to uh, accept God's forgiveness, and they had the heart to forgive each other. Three, they were a loving and united church. Uh, has anybody ever been to a church where you didn't feel the love there? I think we've all been there, or a lot of us have been there. And we don't want to go to a church that's, that doesn't have that loving spirit. We want to be a church that we, we really love each other, sincerely. And then we're united. And that's hard sometimes to be united. Because we all have different opinions on things. That, but... But for sake, for Jesus' name, for the sake of God's glory, we unite. And it's the Holy Spirit that unites the church, that keeps us united. For um, they were a praying and praising church, so that they always, we, we spent this morning in prayer, and we spent this morning in uh, praising God. And we're going to continue to do that. Next, they were a giving church. And this might be the hardest part for some of us. They were a giving church. 
We read in Acts chapter 2, verse 45, they sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. And so they were very giving. They were like, I don't know if God asked me to sell my house, would I have the guts to do that? Sell your house, Jose, and give all that money to the poor. Man, that takes some serious faith to do that. This past week, uh, Vince and I, uh, I think he's upstairs with, with the kid, the kids, but, uh, so I, I went, took him to McDonald's, and we had breakfast together. And so on the way home from McDonald's, I noticed my, my tire was, was lacking in air. So I, I stopped to get some air, so I was, I was filling up the tire with air, because it was really low, and then a homeless lady came up to me, and she looked at me, and she's like, can you buy me some coffee? <laughs> and, and I looked at her, and I said, see if there's like a serious need, but you can tell she was strung out on drugs. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I, I, was, I was ready to go back to work. I needed to get back to the teen center in, in West Sacramento. So I was kind of in a rush. And I was like, I got to get to work. So I, I got into the car and I started driving away. And then the Holy Spirit started speaking to me through events. He's like, Pastor Jose, why don't you buy her some coffee? <laughs> <laughs> and I was, like, I was like, maybe God was testing you. Maybe she was an angel. And I was like, all right. So I went back to AMPM looking for the lady, but she was gone. I failed that test. Haven't we all failed the test sometimes? And so God tests us. Up. He, he's going to test each of us when it comes to the subject of money. Because money can be a stronghold on people. Money could become an idol. It's funny if you were to take the dollar bill out, it says, in God we trust. I don't even have a dollar. Only hundreds. But even on the quarter, it says, in God we trust. But do we really trust God, or do we put our trust in our money? And so these people in the first century ch church, they put their trust in God, not in their money. It's beautiful. And Jesus, this is what Jesus says about money in Matthew 6, 24. No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. That's deep, huh? Yeah. And the Pharisees, they made the mistake. They were very religious. Uh, they did their best to keep the, the commandments of God. They were the religious leaders in the first century. But they had... One problem, and their problem was with money. They put money before God. And so Jesus is preaching out to the Pharisees, hey, you guys think you're all that, but there's one thing that you're doing wrong all the time, and you're putting your money before God. You can't have two masters. Are you going to serve me or serve money? And guess what? The Pharisees decided to serve money. Those Pharisees could have been Jesus' followers, but they're like, no, we can't follow you. Jesus, because you're asking for way too much. You're asking us to put money, be, our money. But we, we got God has to be the God of our money. Yeah. And so the Pharisees weren't willing to do that. And if you think about it, you wouldn't have a dollar to your name. I wouldn't have a dollar to my name. I don't even have a dollar on me. But I do have money on my, my ATM card right, <laughs> in my bank. But I wouldn't have any money in my bank account if it wasn't for God blessing me with a good job. If it wasn't for God taking care of me. So, so the way I put God first in my life and everything is when I, when I get paid, the first thing I do is I give 10% to God. That's my way of saying, God, uh, you come before my money. And that was always, that used to be hard for me when I first started going to church. I remember I was talking to one of the pastors at Horizon Christian Fellowship. I said, hey, I can't give 10%. That's way too much. I'm in college. I'm a starving college student. I, literally, I, I, literally, I was, because I, I used my credit card sometimes to go to Carl's Jr. and buy food for myself, because I was so broke. And, uh, and I was living in an apartment, and just didn't have a lot of money, so 10% was way too much for me, and so I, I, I can't get 10%, I just don't have it. And then Pastor Terry, he was the singles pastor at the time, he said, hey Jose, why don't you start off with 5%? I was like, I could do that, that's nothing. So I started giving 5%, before I, I knew it, I started giving 10%. And I've been giving 10% ever since, and God has taken care of me and my family. And I, 
we have a beautiful home. You know, like we're going to pay off our home in the next 17 years. Uh, God has, even when we've been down and out and I had no work, God has always blessed me. I've never been one of, Sherry could testify, we have never been laid on one bill. The only time we've been laid on a bill is because we forgot to pay it. <laughs> Not because we didn't have the money. But God has taken care of our family. And I think it's because we, we keep God first. We're like, God, we're going to give you the first 10%. It belongs to you. We wouldn't have a dollar to our name if it wasn't for you. There's this rich young ruler. We read this in Mark, Mark chapter 10, verse 17. He ran up to Jesus. I got a photo of, of him. I don't know if he looked like, like him. Uh, but anyhow, maybe I don't have a photo of him. We have a photo of him, sorry. All right, so but, uh, there's this rich ruler. This is pretty humble. He has a lot of money. And he humbles himself before Jesus, and he gets, his, gets on his knees. He is filthy rich. And rich people didn't do this back in the day, and rich people don't do this today. Get on their knees before God. He gets on his knees before God, and he says, Jesus, I want to be your follower. I've kept all your commandments. And then Jesus looks at him in the eye and says, Yeah, you've kept my commandments, but you lack one thing. There's one thing you lack in your life. Sell all your possessions, and then come follow me. And then the rich ruler got up and walked away. I, mean, I know Jesus asked a lot from that rich guy. But look, he had the opportunity of his lifetime to follow Jesus in the flesh. Like, I've, I don't have the opportunity to follow Jesus in the flesh. I'm following the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. But this guy had the opportunity to follow Jesus and be one, the 13th the disciple all he had to do is sell all his stuff. He's like, nah, I don't want to be your 13th disciple. I'm good. Walked away from God. Amazing, huh? And I'm not saying God's calling us to sell all our stuff today. But he does call us to put him first in everything. In our relationships, with our finances, uh, with our decisions. We, God has to be first. Amen? Yeah. It's been said, it's okay to have possessions... But don't let your possessions to have you. How many of you guys have heard that saying before? Well, you've heard it now. <laughs> Acts 2.45. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. Oh, how I want to be like that someday. I'm not there yet, church. But they had a giving heart. And I believe it's the Holy Spirit that empowered them to be so giving. And God's a giving God. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have everlasting life. God gives everything we see. Like the world that we see is, is a gift from God. Our children are a gift from God. Our friends, our work, everything is a gift from God. God is a giving God. And so when we decide to be giving people, we are just being more like our Heavenly Father. Amen? Amen. 1 Timothy 6.10 and this is the challenge for all of us. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. So, see, money is not evil. Let me say it again. Money is not evil. It's the love of money that is the root of all evil. So God doesn't care if you have money. That's fine. But are we just like infatuated with that money? Is, is money our God? Are, are, do we love money more than, than the Lord? Are we looking more at, are we on um, Wells Fargo looking at our, our bank account more than we are looking at the Word of God? Now, I look at my bank account, but like, I'm not like, looking at it all day. All right, $1,000. Yeah. <laughs> or whatever it is. So, uh, Paul's telling young Timothy, don't make the, the serious mistake of, of, of getting so wrapped up with the money. Because some people have wandered from God. And when we just read that story about that rich person that had the opportunity to follow Jesus, but wandered away from God because he, he idolized the dollar bill or whatever coinage they used back then. See, Jesus spoke about money. It's been said that Jesus has, he talks more about money uh, than hell and heaven combined. And that's not true. <laughs> I did a, a search on that. He spoke on heaven 126 times. So 
So he wants people to go to heaven. That's Jesus' main goal. It's like, if you come to know me, you're going to experience heaven here on earth. And then you're going to experience heaven when you, you die. So Jesus spoke about heaven 126 times. He spoke about money 33 times. And he spoke about hell 11 times. He doesn't want people to go to hell. But he had to talk about the subject. That's a real place. But God so loved the world. We know the rest. If we just put our faith in Jesus Christ, we don't have to worry about death. We're promised eternal life. So in Matthew 27, 3, we read this. After they nailed him to the cross, the soldiers gambled for his clothes by throwing dice. That's, that's sad. Even when Jesus is suffering and is on the cross, people are, are, are thinking about money. All right, I'm going to try and win some money now. And they're, they're gambling for Jesus' clothes. How sad is that? Has the world changed? Does our society still put money before God? Mm -hmm. yes. We can't be like that. We've got to be different. Amen? Amen. And here's the, the hardest verse for us to uh, swallow. It's in Malachi 3.8. Put your seatbelts on. You guys have your spiritual seatbelts on? Okay. Will a man or a woman rob God? Yet you are robbing me. This is God speaking. But you say, how have we robbed you, God? In tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me. The whole nation of you. So he's talking to Israel. Everybody's doing it. Bring the tithe into the storehouse, so that you may be... I'm sorry, bring the whole tithe, a tithe is 10%, into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house. See, back in the day, if the people didn't tithe, the, the priests, they didn't eat. So God's like, I don't need money, but the priests do. The, the priests need to survive. Please, give the tithe to, to the, the temple back then. Now we tithe to whatever church we go to. But here's the, the promise right here. And test me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing until it overflows. In other words, God's telling Israel, if you, if you tithe, I'm going to take care of your finances. I'm going to bless your finances. I'm going to take care of you. But if, if you rob me, don't expect my blessing. So don't expect God to bless your finances if you're robbing Him. But if you if you give your first ten percent, and I'm not gonna I'm, I'm not the type of person like, hey, you didn't give ten percent this week. I'm not like that. That's between you and God. But if you give your first ten, your your first fruits, God's gonna bless your finances. You're gonna see an increase, a supernatural increase. That's what God's saying right there. And I gotta admit, I have robbed God. Let me say it again. I have robbed God. I robbed the blessing. I, I robbed myself of a blessing this past week when I didn't take the time to buy that, that homeless lady some coffee. That would have cost me a dollar. It would have cost me five minutes of my time. I could have made time for her. I failed the test. But are you with me? Do we want to learn to be more giving? I know I do. I'm not there yet, but I'm trying to get there. I want to be like this first century church in be willing to give what God asks me to give. Amen? Amen? Next. They were led and empowered by the Holy Spirit. Let me say it again. They were led and empowered by the Holy Spirit. See, the Spirit of God empowered them to be generous. We read in Acts 2.43, A deep sense of awe came over them. Awe. So they, they felt God's presence at these first church meetings. And the apostles performed many miracles, signs, and wonders. So here's the question. Do miracles happen today? Do miracles yes. still happen today? Yes. 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 But sometimes do you get frustrated when you pray for something and it doesn't happen right away? I do. Like I've been praying for my mother-in-law to get better and it hasn't happened yet. I, I have a stomach issue. I've been having it for over a year now. God, heal me. Heal my stomach issue. I, 
who, who, who'd like to burp 40 times in a day? Uh, sometimes I'll burp 40 times in a day. The, the doctor um, three months ago said, Jose, you got diagnosed with acid reflux. So I'm still praying that God will heal my stomach. It's just annoying. Sometimes I try to go to sleep at night and I'm, I'm burping too much. And it's like, God, why won't you heal me? Don't you get frustrated when you pray for someone to get healed and it doesn't happen right away? Mm -hmm. For example, in 2012, a kid named Christian, I'm going to show you a picture of him, uh, he got baptized. Uh, little did the family know, a year later, cancer would take his life. And so I went to Christian's home, because we're friends with the family, and they, they asked me, hey Jose, Pastor Jose, could you pray for him? And so I got my anointing oil, and I, I said, in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and and I start, I prayed my heart out. In Jesus' name, heal this boy, Christian, of this cancer. And God never healed him. And it broke my heart that, that God didn't heal this guy. And I, it, when God doesn't answer our prayer, sometimes we like, we start questioning God, don't we? Sometimes we do. But God had a higher purpose. I was at his funeral, and there was like a thousand people there. Uh, at his funeral service, and the gospel of Jesus Christ was preached that day. And I remember the grandfather sharing a message. I had a dream about Christian last night. And everybody's like, you did? Yeah. He was playing kickball with Jesus. And Christian loved to play kickball. And so, sometimes we, ex we experience our healing in this lifetime, and sometimes we don't experience our healing till the next lifetime. But three years later, God strengthened my faith. There's a young girl named Alize. She's from West Sacramento. There was a drive-by shooting that took place, in, took place in Broderick. Broderick's the old part of West Sacramento where uh, the Broderick boys uh, live. And uh, apparently what happened was, because I, I was talking to one of the Broderick boys, he, he had the inside scoop what really took place. They were going after her brother. And so they shot up her house, and the bullet penetrated her right brain and exited in her left brain. She was good as dead. She was in a coma for 30 days. But we kept praying for her, praying for her. I took out the anointing oil. I anointed her forehead in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. I, I brought my Bible to the hospital, and I prayed all the scriptures I could think of about healing. And it didn't happen right away, but one day I got a call from from my friend Lydia, she said, Pastor Jose. I was like, what? She's alive! She's alive! I knew that. I knew God was going to bring her back to life. And she came back to life. I went to go visit her in this very home. I was like, Alize, how are you doing? And she's like, she had a big bright smile on her face. And she's like, she told me she saw Jesus. She saw Jesus and she came back to earth. And now it's a great miracle. She's talking. She's at River City High School now. Uh, junior in high school. She's even walking. It's unbelievable. Who survives a bullet going through a brain to both sides of the brain? And she's alive. Uh, Alizé is living proof that God still performs miracles. So do you need a miracle in your life? Pray. That's when the miracle starts, starts to have its effect. When you start praying, it might not happen right away, but it will happen in due time. And so the, the first century church was experiencing great miracles. Hope City Church, we're going to experience great miracles. Get ready for them. Amen? Amen. <laughs> Lastly, they were an evangelistic church. The word evangel simply means one who announces good news. We can't forget we got the good news, not the bad news. I mean, if you want to listen to the bad news, watch the 530 news. That's the bad news. Yep. But we have the good news. Just imagine like if uh, tomorrow scientists, they came up with a cure for cancer. I mean, that would be all over the news, wouldn't it? They finally came up with a cure for cancer. But they're only selling at one location. It's mm. the Walgreens here in Roseville. You know how big that line would be? To get that wonder drug to save people from cancer? I mean, that line would be from 
Roseville, all the way to New York City, people would be lined up to get this wonder drug to save their son or daughter from cancer. They would spend thousands of dollars, millions of dollars to get this wonder drug to save their son or daughter's life. But we can't forget, church, we have something that saves people's souls. I mean, Jesus Christ has the ability to save people's life. Not just in this lifetime, but the life to come. So we have this good news. Are we just going to share it? Are we just going to keep it? As I said, uh, keep the faith, but don't keep the faith to yourself. So we're called to share the good news that, you know, Jesus saves. He saves us from our sins. He saves us from our troubles or helps us get through our troubles. And so my challenge for you is this week, find someone to share the good news with. Maybe it's just by sharing your story, how God saved you. Or maybe it's just by praying for that person. Or inviting that person to our, our upcoming uh, event in next month when we have our first church service in the building. Or uh, sharing the flyer when we get our flyers next week with somebody and inviting them that way. We read in John 17, 3, Jesus says this about eternal life. And this is the way to have eternal life. To know you, God the only true God, and Jesus Christ, the one you sent to earth. So it's simple. You want to have eternal life? You, all you have to do is know God. You've got to know Jesus. And so sometimes it's hard for our, our minds to comprehend how the eternal life going to look like, like how it's like. I was, when I was a youth, I went to Capital Christian Center to youth group one, one Wednesday, and then one of the preachers described heaven. He's like, just pretend for a moment that you went to the ocean and then you had a teaspoon and then you went to the ocean and, and then you grabbed a teaspoon of water from the ocean and you did your best to balance that water inside that teaspoon. Well, that teaspoon of water represents your life on earth. Eternity is the ocean. And that's what Jesus promises each of us, eternity in heaven when we put our faith in him. It's a beautiful thing, isn't it? And so all of us have opportunities to uh, invite people to church or share our faith with them one-on-one. -on -one. And then they have an opportunity to experience heaven, a place that never ends. Amen? Amen. And then we read in Acts 2.41, those who accepted the message, what message? The message of Jesus. They were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to the number that day. Wow. See, God increased the church. And so God's going to increase our church. It's going to happen in time. Acts 2.46. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. See, see God was bringing this church to life. This, this original church started planting new churches. And before you knew it, you know it, there was churches all over the Middle East. Then the churches started going. Then there was churches in Europe. Then eventually churches came to America. Now we have churches all around the world. And, and one day, Jesus says, when the good news is preached to all nations, then he's going to come back. And, and right now we have missionaries doing their best to get the word of God spread throughout the world. And, and we believe in missions. Uh, actually, Michael this week, we